You are listening to the Hostage to the Devil podcast. Some listeners may find this content disturbing. Hello, Jimmy. Hello, Marty. Returning champion to the podcast. Thank you. <laughs> Jimmy, a.k.a. Mr. Haunted. Marty, I'm not a doctor, but I play one on television. I always wanted to do that, so we got that out of the way. <laughs> Brilliant, mate. So it's been... Um... Yeah, it's been a while since you were last on. You came on with Lorene last time. Oh, it must be about two years ago now, was it? Yeah, we were just kids back then. We were kids and naive and vulnerable. And look at us now. Look, look now. Look at us now. Reaping we have similarities, I see. Yeah, yeah. I love the, I love the, yeah. I love the post in the background. And and I actually got, uh, I got you beat. Is that um? Oh, 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 oh. bit of merch. Uh, for those of you who can't see, he's wearing a. Hostage to the Devil t-shirt, but a merch. It came all the way from Belfast. <laughs> Let's get straight in then, because um, I'm a cheap ass and haven't yes. recorded the Zoom. So we've got, we've got 35 minutes, mate, of 35 minutes of pure golden nuggets. Mm -hmm. So let's start with, give us a little roundup of last time I spoke to you then. So um, primarily like the, the paranormal industry, you know, What's the community like at the moment with regards to how we left off last time? I don't remember, honestly, Marty. I'm not going to waste your 40 minutes thinking about it. But um, it's a disaster right now. If I look around, if I see the internet, a lot of drama going on. I'm not into the drama. I just do my thing. Is it, is, is, are you finding that it's more about people trying to like, become personalities in the industry rather than doing the, doing the work, doing the, um, the core work, which is, you know, it's, which is very serious and very important. All right, you got me talking, Marty. Go it's for a it. Little, it's a little disheartening. And, I, you know, all these people, I see a lot of people get interviewed and they always try to uh, set a date when they started to show, I've been involved with the paranormal since 1983 or whatever to make it seem like you're, nobody's any better than anybody else. Or I've been to thousands of haunted places. But it's really disheartening, kind of, to see the people that, um, especially those people that make up stories, yeah, and they get and they they get on TV and they get a little yeah. bit of fame. And people are uh, get a million followers, and people are paying to see them at events and stuff based on lies. Okay, and it's it's hard for the people that really put all this work into there. Now I don't have any videos of people's heads spinning, but I put a lot of work into this, and a lot of other people have too. And to see, uh, you know, the other people kind of jump over you just by um, embellishing, making up stuff. It's, it's sad. Nothing you can do about it. Just a little disheartening for those folks that were in the trenches for decades. Yeah. Is it, is it, is it feeding, is, you, you find it's feeding their ego or this all this uh, newfound fame, it just feeds their ego and then they lose sight of the, the, the real work that needs to be done? I don't know. I was never famous, Marty, so I can't speak for that. <laughs> well, your mom, your mom thought you were cool, mate. Yeah. My <laughs> mom thinks I'm fancy. <laughs> so talk us through this new book that you've, you're have you bringing out. Talk, talk, talk me through the origins of what made you put pen to paper, what what motivated you to to get this book out there. Well, talking about ego and uh, <laughs> selfishness, I my dad passed away a couple of years ago, and my dad was a character – just his stories would be one of the most interesting books ever. He had so many great stories. And now his friends are telling me more stories that he was afraid to tell me probably. And it's sad because I don't have any documentation of my dad. And, and like I said, it's almost, I guess, I don't know if the word selfishly, but I, I want to leave something for my kids to say, oh, this is what my dad did. You know, if they want it one day. So it's why I did it primarily to tell my stories so my kids would know what I did, you know, so yeah. I had to have something. So I created this book, 50 Years in the Making. It's a beautiful looking book, Marty. That's great, man. Yeah. I've bought in books before just because the cover looks so cool and I want it on my shelf. Absolutely. It's click, but click. This is a yeah. nice look, and it's a nice looking book. It's shiny. Man. It is. And I designed it and everything. And it's, look at this, my head spinning journey. From investigating haunted cemeteries to assisting an exorcist. Beautiful, man. Holy mackerels. So, so what's, what's the premise of the book then, just for the audience? It's, uh, it's <clears throat> anybody that does movies, this would be a great 
screenplay <laughs> adaptation. It starts off with a violent scene from an exorcism I was assisting with. And there's no embellishments. There's not one embellishment in here. I know, you know, the only thing that uh, might be inconsistent is, uh, oh, well, on one interview, I might have said I was eight years old when this happened. And another one, I said 10, you know, that kind of stuff. But it, there's not one embellishment. It's exactly word for word what happened. And um, the, the book starts with a violent exorcism that I was assisting with when the woman was biting me, that broke out of her restraints, threatening everybody. And I, I did that, you know, that Wayne's World back 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 uh, back to the future music. Then I go, but how did I get here? How did I get in this situation? So then I go back to when I was like five or six years old and had some um, strange experiences that kind of piqued my interest in in you know discovering some answers into the unknown realm. Thank you. Sorry, mate. So um... I have growing up stories. Um, my first paranormal experience that I would consider paranormal, how I got involved with Emma Ed and Lorraine. And um, that way, there's a whole chapter. There's a whole hostage to the devil chapter in here. Yeah. A there's a lot chapter. of, I find a lot of people have a view about Ed and Lorraine Warren. Obviously, you were, you know, you were part of the team back in the day. So can you sort of give us your sort of summary of, of, of Ed and Lorraine Warren? Uh, it's hard to do a summary, but um, just being part of that whole crew back then, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I mean, uh, it was the best times ever. We were going out every week to tons of, uh, um, you know, investigations, at least getting interviewed. Like people, people are going to make fun of like, oh, they've been to thousands of homes or whatever. They have. Because just, just in like a, a one week, um, we'd have our, our little meetings on Monday evenings, and sometimes we'd go to like two or three houses after that just to check them out. These, you know, they'd review their um, their phone messages with us that night, and then say, "Hey, we're thinking about checking out a couple of these houses." And we'd go to two or three places sometimes after uh, our classes, and then um, other ones throughout the week. And then they were doing their own stuff, so they they really did go to thousands of houses. Not all of them are uh, Amityville, but you know they, you know, we put in the work. And what were they like as people? You know, obviously you you've got a subjective opinion on Ed and Lorraine Warren, but obviously and there's a lot of um, a lot of stories out there and misconceptions about them and their relationship. Uh, as people, as as colleagues, as friends, you know, who were they to you? They, uh, as far as that, I wasn't there, so I I would never comment on on people's uh, opinions or whatever they might think. But uh, a couple examples are when I was in, um, so when I was growing up, I had an interest in this stuff, but there was no internet. It was only, you'd only find out the information that you could find out in a few books that they sold. That, that's it. That's all you got. And when I was in college, when I, I got to see them speak and they came to see us, I'm like, oh, these are our people. They're showing me all the stuff that I like, especially the brown lady of Raynham Hall that I always said I wanted to get that picture. I want to get one of those pictures myself. So they started talking about um, haunted cemeteries in the area, and then that's, that's how I started um, taking pictures and stuff. The point is, when I saw them in college, three years later or so, they were actually showing my pictures on their in their presentation. So I went from being you know uh, somebody in the audience to part of their show, which was really cool and. Um, Another thing about them is their, uh, for example, they were doing uh, sightings came. Remember that show sightings? They came to um, Connecticut to do uh, two segments on two haunted cemeteries in Connecticut. And, uh, you know, I went just to watch the whole filming process. And they were filming Lorraine walk through the cemetery. And then uh, she goes, hey, she goes, I want to get my students in here. And they're like, well, that wasn't really our plan. She goes, I want to get our students in here. She goes, Jim, come on. So the guy got to be part of their the, the whole episode. Um, so she, she took care of us. Um, Ed was like a normal dude. Like, uh, you know, I, I uh, we were investigating this house in New Jersey, and I thought I got some. I thought I had some cool stuff on video. Like I got this um, looks like a baby's face or a alien head that was on the wall. You know, when we were going by this hallway. So I said, I called him up and said, hey, I got this. And I figured we wait till next week to show them when they have their 
their meetings, whatever. He goes, come on over. Like, you just come on over? Like, yeah. And he's, they went over, popped it in the thing. He's like, well, I don't know. You know. But it was just, they're very accessible and helpful. And, uh, you know, they, it was cool. They, they got you involved, you know. Was religion grounded in their work as well? Were they, were they religious people? As far as I know, yeah. But um, I remember it was a, um, it was, I forget the word. But it was a common. It was every every time before our our meeting started, or when we were about to go to a a house, a case, or whatever. Um, you know, they'd uh, start with the uh, Lord's Prayer, Hail Mary, um, Glory be to the Father, and the Saint Michael prayer. Like every time, that was a thing. So it was that anyway. And uh, were there any cases that stand out? In your mind, from from working with the Warrens, any cases that really like knocked Holy you sick? Well, yeah, the the first um, they said they didn't um send you out immediately, like just because you start attending their Monday night meeting class classes. Okay, go out check out this house. You know, you'd you'd uh, be part of the group, and they'd usually send you know, you know that themselves. They would go and bring a few people along with them, and um you know, to kind of get your feet wet. And then um, it was always part of a group. And then my, my, my friend, Rick Clark, we kind of worked as a team. We started on the same day. And um, one night Lorraine called us up and said, uh, there's this house in Waterbury, Connecticut, that the, the woman there will not go inside our house until somebody gets there. So this is our opportunity. Like she called us like, this is just us, you know, by ourselves. So, um, with this, this is before Google. I have no idea how we found this house, but um, we did, and we got there. And the woman was, you know, just like she said, sitting on the front steps, crying, um, saying she's not going inside the house until you know we get there. So that was a um, interesting case. This was our first one too. We saw some stuff. And what I mean, don't want to pry here, but what made that case, you know? What made that stand out? What well, obviously it was your first. It was your first case, so obviously everyone sort of, you know, cuffing it as we say over here. You know, yeah. blagging well, it and just going for the motions. Yeah, I'm not trying to promote. I'm just saying that it, in man. this promote. book, <laughs> this this story is included in this book as uh, the chapter is called the Muffin Man. The Muffin Man. Very scary. Just just the name of the Muffin Man is very scary. <laughs> so wait, oh, wait, I gotta get some. Hold on. Yeah. So we got there. The woman's hysterically crying. She's only, yeah. I mean, she's only 20, 21 years old. Very young, um, young woman. She had a um, three-year-old son um, and a boyfriend she lived with. And uh, her boyfriend was working. He worked nights. And her three-year-old was staying with her mom. Because she, she had so many problems in her house. She, the mother gave her a break a lot and took the kid. So um, she's frantically trying to tell us. Like, you know, oh, my God, I saw the shadow figure in my house. I can't take it anymore. You know, it's just rapid fire telling us the story. And I said, like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, let's get our stuff out of the car and uh, go upstairs and, and get your stories. What's documented on film. So we get up. We get up. to. She was on the second or third floor apartment of a three family house. And we went up the stairs and the the door, the door wouldn't open. Like the knob would go back and forth, but it wouldn't move forward. It's like, I don't know what's going on. So Rick like pushed the door open, like, a, you know, the police bang. And we heard this big bang. And this um, exercise bike was uh, thrown across the room onto the floor. And she goes, that exercise bike was like eight feet away when I left this room. She was, you know, so looking at it, it looked like, um, exercise bike's handle might have been wedged underneath the handle so we couldn't push it forward so we like we don't know if she's just making up stories or she could have done that herself whatever but i remember we went around to the back door to say you know maybe she set this up and went out the back door but the back door had a, a deadbolt on it and she even said i don't even, I didn't even take the key with me and also there was a, a fire i don't know how long ago the fire was but um they had the access to the ground like boarded off because of damage so you know it's kind of kind of curious now and then um so i said let's sit down at the dining room table with the we had the old-fashioned tape recorder and video recorder on her 
and the whole you know we said let's start from day one what what started how would you move in when this stuff started happening and um she as we're as she's telling us a story she keeps pointing at random directions like oh my god don't you see it don't you see it like see what she goes it's a shadow like we don't see any shadow and she goes as what's it look like she goes it's like a man outside of the wall standing don't you see it I'm like you don't see anything so you know honestly you know you get older you get a little wiser but back then we, we weren't believing her and um she said it went okay she said, went into the bedroom so we're like, okay, let's go into the bedroom and go see the thing. So me and Rick and her went down the hallway, looking into the bedroom. Like, yeah, we see something. <laughs> now we see something. And like she said, it looked like a, a man standing, uh, a shadow standing, you know, uh, inside the room. It's only a couple of feet from uh, the corner. And it looked like it was a regular slim, five foot nine male figure. And um, you're even, you know, we're even adjusting, the, turning the lights on and off, trying to see if it's a play of the shadows, moving the door back and forth, saying, you know, and it's not changing. And so I would say, what a terrible investigator am I? Because I left my camera, both of them, in the other room, interviewing her. And now here's this right here. Might never see this, you know, again in our lives. So I said, Rick, do I? Should I go back and get my video camera? This would be amazing footage. Nobody would ever believe it. And he's like, I don't know. I was like, ah, I didn't want to go get the camera. If it disappears, I'll never see this again. And I just want to kind of take it in, experience it. So he says, well, let's go try to touch it. That's a good idea. So he took, we took like a step and a half forward. And um, as we were taking a step forward, the thing like turned like this and went, stepped into the wall. The way it looked, like it looks like it would have walked through the wall and into the hallway on the other side. So I, I went around the hallway to see if it came out, but it, it didn't. So then after that, um, we got our interview and then we, you know, investigated that house for a couple of weeks. Um, it was a great story. What I want to know is where did the Muffin Man title come from? That's a great question. <laughs> this woman, um, this is a three-year-old boy. Oh, do I have the sneakers for you? I wasn't prepared. Um, one of the complaints she had was when she'd, she'd frequently bake stuff. So she was, I'd uh, make cookies, and then she'd put them on top of the refrigerator and even told us, we, I pushed them in the back because I don't even want my kids to know that they're up there. And he's three. He's not climbing the counters, stealing, but just in case. So she said they'd go shopping or do whatever they're doing. And then they come back and she'd go to get the cookies and they're gone. Like the plates there, she's such a little doily in there. The Everything's there but the cookies. Then she like three days later, she would go into the closet to get the vacuum when she cleaned the house and she'd see the cookies all stacked in the closet. It's kind of, it's, it's weird, but it's kind of scary if they don't belong there. Then she made muffins, a whole plate of muffins. And um, same thing. It would uh, They disappeared. She accused her boyfriend. She's like, did you eat the muffins? She goes, why would I steal your muffins? So then um, they had some friends over in the kitchen one night. And their little three-year-old boy was playing by himself in the living room. And he comes into the room trembling. Like, you know, he's upset. And the mom says, what's the matter? And he, he leads, her to the, leads her into the living room and is pointing behind the couch. And he's trembling, you know, he's scared. And he's pointing the back of the couch and all the muffins that were missing were stacked in the back of the couch. Which um, we found out later that stacking is like a kind of fairly common thing, especially on like poltergeist-like cases. Um, and then uh, I'm trying to figure out how... And she never had any experiences before. Like there's no history of her or any of the family members having... It seemed like to be the, the apartment or the house. So she moved out um, a month later, but the uh, um, yeah, they're gonna uh, Ed and Lorraine had it um, scheduled. A priest came and blessed the whole house um, be before they left. And the, another interesting thing about that house is um, when they were, when they were moving all their stuff out, they left the boys' sneakers, which are the little LA gear ones that light up, and. Uh, 
of course, the, because Ed and Lorraine collected stuff from their houses, you know, I was looking at them like, yeah, I'm like this. And um, because the story about them was they said they'd be, uh, especially when it was nighttime, they'd start blinking while they're just sitting on the floor. And so they scared me. It seems like they were mocking me. And uh, she was, they'd go back and forth. And then I wouldn't look. They wouldn't light up. Then, it, you know, the quarter of my eye, they kept blinking. So I said, well, I don't know how they work. Maybe it's the uh, vibrations from the floor or a bad battery or something. She was like, well, maybe. But she was my mother. Then her, her mother was there for the interviews. And the mother said, no, you don't understand. She goes, I saw those sneakers walk across the boy's room when I was in the hallway. Those sneakers walked right across her grandson's room in the dark lit up without any feet in them. So I was like, of course, can I have those? She's like, yes. <laughs> so the muffin man was one of the names they gave the, you know, the shadow figure. Yeah. Thank you. Nice. I always wanted, I always wanted to know where the uh, haunted sneaker origin story was. So there you go. We have them somewhere here, but famous, I'm not going to waste Famous Mr. Haunted, haunted sneakers. The real. Uh, yeah. I've, I've seen them. Mate. When I was in, uh, Oh yeah, I was in your. You came, over. You came yeah, yeah. over. I came over in 2016. It was. How yeah. can so I forget that? In the basement, yeah, it was. Um, it was cool. Question for you about, you know, you, you've you've spent a lot of your life gathering evidence. Do you find that, like, regardless of what you capture, people are always going to be skeptical of what they see anyway? Yes, I used to get so upset, um, when I used to post. I know. I understand now, especially when we uh, used to post these. When it was new and it's in its infancy and people would go to these haunted cemeteries or any cemetery and and post pictures of the orb you know i'm a, into the orbs but um even the the smoky stuff and it's like you uh, unless you're doing it scientifically you just don't know what is it fog is it a car exhaust is it cigarette smoke is it gas coming from the ground um is it a bug going but you know all these things that you look at and um, and if I used to, uh, and I said, I wouldn't, I would only take pictures of crystal clear nights after I learned the lessons of taking pictures, don't use a flash, you know, and then like, you know, waste a lot of time taking pictures, but every once in a while you get something really dramatic and then you post it because you're trying to show, Hey, look what I got. And then, and then everybody's like, that's this, that's that. And then, and then, you know, it used to get, to you, but now you're, now it's like, who cares? But with the regular film back in the olden days with um, with AI now and Photoshop and everything, it's like I would tend to believe stuff more from the 70s and 80s and 90s that people pr provided as evidence then. You could get it. I said I could make an alien invasion happen in my backyard right now in five minutes. And yeah. uh, so it's kind of difficult for proof nowadays unless you – you know, it's like I don't try to prove anything to anybody. It's like I, um, I just enjoy – the experience and relating your experiences. So what happens now when somebody is experiencing some maybe poltergeist activity or an infestation or maybe oppression, demonic oppression, whatever, whatever it is they, they perceive it to be. What, what is the, who is their point of call now? Is it the church still? Is it, is it communities, paranormal groups? Where, where do people go? Well, like I said, back then, um, and the Warrens were the only people I knew that were, I'm sure there were other people doing it, but it was the only people I knew that were doing it. So a lot of people always said how everything they investigated was demonic, whether you believe in demonic or not, you, you understand if you're the only people doing this sort of thing, you're getting dozens of phone calls each week and you're only going to go to the worst of the worst that kids are involved or somebody it's going to be violent or so. Yeah. You got a lot of the, worst cases that's what you so you got and back to your question now what happens now if someone's oh someone's... yeah thank you um I know a lot of people have their own techniques of doing stuff but um as far as the church goes we don't have a, a bishop mckenna or malachi martin anymore to um that was um not reluctant to get involved and and help people and not that i know of maybe there's some out there but um, we were really spoiled back then because, you know, they they trusted us, and if we said we thought something might be legitimate, they would set up, you know, set up an exorcism. 
So uh, how, um, how would you how would you have described Father Martin and um, Bishop McKenna back back in the day? Then were they rogue? Were they underground? Did that, yeah. Did they break away from the church? You know, that's what, okay. it kind of it kind of kind of made them cooler in a, in a way because, um, and as far as integrity goes, they were just getting attacked by everyone for trying to do the right thing. Uh, they, they were they were doing an old school like it always was done, but yet they're getting attacked by the people that um you know want to do it the new way or the the new religion and um, th th that's exactly what happened in the 90s um they were already doing this i'm acting like i started the whole thing with them but when, with our group we started a whole underground exorcism we had a you know it was we had a book that we we created with all different states and with everybody's help um we tried to find churches that were traditional catholic church that still believed in this stuff that were willing to do an exorcism or at least help these people um in different states because we couldn't have everyone come here so we created this whole underground exorcism system that um you know if somebody from idaho called said okay we got a couple churches here you could check out see if they could help you or whatever um so that that's we were really spoiled back then nowadays i mean we're i don't want to mention names but somebody that we've been working with for years that was um, going to be um, possibly part of the hostage too. She's been working with the Roman Catholic Church for I don't know five or six years now, and she's yet to get uh, the, the legit the big exorcism. She went to the you know center for counseling and um, like a test, not for counseling counseling, but for um, what's the word evaluation. She, that she's had blessings at her house and stuff, but she's still waiting. There's funny. There's a headline I have somewhere, uh, an old newspaper. It says, Bishop, where's my exorcism? It's exactly like, uh, you know, it just takes years for some of these people. And if you can imagine if this stuff is, it, it, if you believe in it and it's real, and somebody you know is getting attacked by an incubus, suppose, for years on and off, and you're saying, oh, you know, in time we're going to help you. Like, can you imagine? Like, like help. We were so close to getting um, the sequel, the hostage, hostage to the Devil done, and then COVID struck. Pandemic. So yeah, the, the, the well, the scamdemic in my eyes. Um, I was thinking about the other day, actually. It was like my, my ultimate goal was to film an exorcism, you know, with respect, you know, and obviously protect you involved yep. and getting the right people involved. That still is my goal, is to document a real ritual. And people think I'm crazy for doing it. People think I'm just, you know, using it for the wrong reasons. For me, I think the people deserve to see a, a professionally documented exorcism, rite of exorcism. I think I'm, I'm not just doing it for, you know, for TV or film. I, I'm, I think the people, I think it warrants a the effort to 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 create a professional documentation of, of a rites of ritual i, I can right help you out right there because only because um bishop mckenna allowed us to not only allowed us to record the exorcisms he encouraged it because for, first of all for liability reasons just yeah. somebody starts flo floating around and killing everybody <laughs> you have a camera um it's not but um he he wanted to um show people that, that that this is going on still it's real and i can possibly help you that's why he wanted this and then because of that big um that prime time exorcism um on abc that they showed from our group that, that we got calls from all over the country of uh, you know led to 50 exorcisms from different people that would have never known about getting help over here if it wasn't for that so the, like like how many people you know were helped just by that documentation yeah and I, I, it's, it's still my plan to to come over and i mean we we talk we we, we describe it as like the sequel to hostage of the devil but it it for my in my eyes it, it's literally a stand it can still be a standalone documentary but the aim still is to document a right of exorcism that's 100 percent. that hasn't changed and i do and when the time is right you know i believe everything happens for a reason and the timing is always you know perfect I think um, it is going to get done. It is going to get made. And um, it will be done professionally with respect. We'll have the protection involved. You know, we, we will, 
yeah, we'll, all all parties will be respectful, um, and it will be include people, characters, contributors who who are not doing it for the wrong intention. You know, people we will document people who are there for the right reasons, which is to continue to do the work and continue to help people, which is what Bishop McKenna, Father Martin was trying to do back in the day. Um, so be it underground. So that is hasn't changed. That that is still going to happen. I'm not sure when, but I'm like a dog with a bone anyway. I'm, it, it, it's it's still gonna it's still going to happen. Um, people think I'm mad for doing it. People think I'm being disrespectful, but something inside me just just drives me to get the team together, get the right team together, and to document and to multiple cameras document the whole experience from start to finish. No no cutting, no editing. Just just let the right um go on have it documented professionally with the right equipments with the right people like i said so that that hasn't changed so i, I do look forward it sounds sounds strange to say that but i do look forward to coming back over and yeah. getting the team back together and, and get it you, done you know the only thing um good about getting older is just don't <laughs> don't care what people think as much anymore Exa exactly I don't, I don't care i told yeah, stories yeah. i told stories in here that would get me in trouble 20 years ago and yeah. I, I just don't care yeah, no, that's it's it's a great. It's what happened. You know, with lifting experience, you you do you do get more reflective on life. And when when obviously when Hostage to the Devil was my first ever film, so I was obviously naive. I was I was it was my baby, and it was it was I was very I was very I was very proud of what we've done. But you know, just like Father Martin himself, he, people loved him or hated him. You know, and it was the same with the film. The 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 response we got was very mixed, which is fine. But for me as a young filmmaker, you know, well, not, well, I wasn't that young, but back in 2016, it was, it was hard for me to, to, to receive that um, negative backlash. Yeah. You know? Criticism. Crit um, cr criticizing everything from there wasn't enough critics of Mar Maliki in the film. You're obviously pro, pro father Martin and pro father Martin. And then it was like, you shouldn't have had that, critic in the film it was very disrespectful so you, you just as a filmmaker storyteller you just can't win as long you're as you're damned you... if you do and damned if you don't exactly you don't. mate and as you say with wisdom and age you just don't care anymore you, ju you just as long and as your intention is pure with something I do you remember that, that when uh, you first had it um filmed before you released it you sent me a, a link to watch it yeah and you said how'd you feel about it yeah and i was like i was sad at the end because of yeah, the, yeah. The, the the phone ringing and then, then you said after you had it all completed, is that oh, you were you were angry? You said, ah, I would have left this. I wanted to. I was thinking about it. I should have left this in, taken this yeah, yeah. out. And you're never you're you never happy yourself with insane, the, yeah. the completed. Yeah. That's why with this book too, I'm not trying to talk about, it, but it's like I understand now that after it comes out, it's like, oh, I would have left this out. I would have added this. But sometimes you just gotta put it out the way it is and move on. As you say, you, you also it's a legacy for your children as well. The, the, the joy of what I do is. I create these films, tell these stories, which, which, what you're in, which are out there forever. You know, that, that is my legacy for my children to, to look at what their father has created in, in his time. Exactly. Here. And um, let's, let's finish off with the book. Let's get, bring the audience back to the new book that's coming out. So where can we find it? Where can we buy it? It's just came out available. I think May 28th, 29th or something like that. So it's only um, been out for like a month, not a month and a half yet. Beautiful. It's called Mr. Haunted Origins. And for any of you people that remember the Cold Jack the Night Stalker TV show, which was my favorite, I um, it was influenced by the, that's why I did that font like that. So it looks like Cold Jack the Night Stalker. And I was a superhero nerd when I was a kid. So getting the origin of any of those superheroes was all exciting to me. So I kind of incorporated all my little things I grew up with into this. Right, mate. Very, uh, very proud of you, buddy. Very proud of you. I got a whole hostage chapter in here talking oh, wow. about how you guys drove up to my driveway <laughs> terrified me yeah and i and yeah. I, I irish two irishmen and a scouser getting in coming into the house and it was a whole driveway full of people <laughs> tell the lights cameras tell me to sit over there whoa, whoa. yeah i've never seen here? you smoke so much in my life mate oh my god <laughs> it's brutal right mate we're, we're drawing to a close um next time i'll see you we'll be making the second installment for the I film. will start my diet today. Start your diet. Don't dye your hair, mate. Your hair's beautiful. Look at me. I'm I'm look, I'm I'm look, 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 look. I'm going gray, mate. Well oh, then you know what we'll look you know what look really dumb. You filmed like half of this previously yeah. when you came over. So it would be it would be 
weird to have me like this yeah in the beginning and then all of a sudden his hair turned white <laughs> in the next scene we have to well, that's keep, what the work uh, does to you mate it ages you quickly mate that's that, what the work that, does to you well, Great, mate, well, um, there. yeah i'm really happy you've you've got the book out mate we'll plug it as much as we can as well and uh, thanks for being a massive advocate of the show, mate, of the um, podcast and the film. And good news, the the film is now available in the UK via Sky Store and Amazon, which take it's taken ages. But um, yeah, glad to say that the film is available in the UK um, as well as the Let's US. Go, go watch that. Go watch it, mate. But no, next time I see you, mate, we'll be doing the work again, mate. Little Leopard over and out. Cheers, mate. Thanks for listening and remember we have a Facebook page too so please give us a like and buy us a coffee over at buymeacoffee.com to help us keep this podcast going and it would only be right to finish with the main man himself. Well, the, the, from what we know about shamanism and the activities of shamans that now exist because we, we, can only, we can only treat with shamans that exist and not with what people say about them but the shamans that do exist mainly are uh, relying on natural means to to befuddle their, 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 their adherence. But there are, amongst the shamans, genuine uh, people dedicated to Satanist ritual. And in that case, we have possession. Okay, and uh, I was wondering if you'd comment on the cultural uh, causation, materialism versus idealism. Well, the, there's no doubt about it that where materialism reigns and where idealism or the, the life of the spirit is crushed, there's no doubt about it, the Satanism and Satanist rituals flourish. It's a known fact. Simply, it, as night follows day, or as, not, yes, as night follows day, is the best image. Whenever there's a, a loss of spirit, a loss of religion, a loss of morals and ethics, there always is an accompanying uh, Satanist reaction. Always.